Hi, in this video, I'd like to walk through an actual case study of value risk mapping, that's VAR mapping, specifically as it is illustrated by Philip Jorian in chapter 11 of his book, Value at Risk. So what we'll do is we'll take a two bond fixed income portfolio. It's gonna have a value of 200 million, and we're going to look at VAR mapping under three different approaches. And that mapping means that we'll take the value of the portfolio and we'll map it to one primitive risk factor or in the more sophisticated case, five primitive risk factors, which will be really a simplification exercise so that we can take in theory what is a complex portfolio and replace it or map it to simple, a limited set of simple risk factors, and then we can shock or stress the risk factors as a means of estimating the risk of the portfolio. A fair starting question is, why are we mapping at all? The answer is that VAR mapping is the solution to a problem of complexity and aggregation in a modern large portfolio. So if we imagine a large portfolio with many positions, here I've illustrated only those represented by only four instruments, but you can see it's one, two, three. Imagine some number up to N instruments or positions in the portfolio. We could probably all agree that it's actual true exposure to risk factors is probably complicated. There are probably many of them. VAR mapping comes along and says, Let's identify the limited number of risk factors to which this portfolio is mostly exposed. And so maybe there are one, two, three risk factors that of course will not explain the entire ex exposure, but maybe they explain 90% or 95% or more. Maybe we had a fourth risk factor, we're gonna get 98% of the exposure, such that we could say here, this first position instrument one, it's largely characterized by exposure to this first risk factor and this second risk factor, for example, instrument two, maybe it's largely exposed also to the first risk factor and to the third one, maybe instrument three is predominantly exposed just to risk factor two and so on. This is the essential mapping of a complex portfolio with true exposures to many multiple complicated risk factors to a small set of what we call primitive risk factors. And they are they meet the test because you could take a risk factor like our first one here, and there are gonna be several instruments in the portfolio that have some exposure to this risk factor. Risk factors can be something like a spot exchange rate. I'm Illustrating here the approach in Jorian's chapter 11, VAR mapping, where you use a fixed income portfolio. So our risk factors are going to be zero coupon bonds, either one zero coupon bond, or we'll see in the most sophisticated approach, it's going to be mapped, we're gonna to map to five zero coupon bonds. And so I'll show that in the following three sheets, but here are the three steps that I'm gonna do. First sheet, I'm just going to identify those five risk factors, those primitives. Those are gonna be the risk factors to which we could map in, in our scenario here, any of our portfolio situations. Second, we'll just take a look at the portfolio. And on the third sheet then, I've just illustrated or demonstrated the three fixed income mapping approaches that Jorian shows. One principle, two duration, and three cash flow. And what we'll see in this case is, in terms of the portfolio, we're going to have a $200 million fixed income portfolio. It's only gonna be two bonds, just to keep the illustrative example as simple as possible, that happen to e e equally weight the portfolio. So uh, a, a one-year bond with a value of $100 million and also a five-year bond, or I've got the reverse five-year bond and a one-year bond, each with a value of 100 million. So together they equally weight the $200 million portfolio. And then the VAR mapping process is to take that $200 million in value, dollar exposure here, and map it to primitives. So in general, we want to account for all 200 by mapping to primitive risk factors. 
And then if there were some riskless portion of it, let's say if, with cash, we would allocate the balance to cash as the riskless portion. That's not the case here. And then having mapped the portfolio to the primitive risk factors, we basically, from a risk perspective, replace the portfolio with the mapping to risk factors. And then what we do is we shock the risk factors. If we only have three, then a measuring risk becomes a, a, a simpler test of simply shocking our risk factors and saying then what would happen. And we also could use that to stress test. Okay, so in terms of the risk factors here, actually go back, we have to go back to Jorian chapter eight, which I've just extracted most of that exhibit here. And okay, so the, we got a lot of columns here, but no worries. The only one that's really important here is what I've colored in light red, and that's what's called returns var. And so we can also call that the risk column. This is the risk because for each of our primitive risk factors, which are going to be five zero coupon bonds, this is the worst expected change in price. How do we get that? Well, we have yield VARs, which actually are calculated themselves. I'm not going to bore you with that exhibit, but the yield VAR is a simple idea. It's based on, you can see the yield VAR here is pretty close to 50 basis points across the term structure. And it's really just based on an assumption that the yield volatility is, you could see about 30 basis points. So that's just straight up yield volatility. And then an assumption that that yield volatility is normally distributed. We're doing a 95% VAR. So multiplied by about 1.65 is getting us about, about 50 basis points. So again, if the volatility yields 30 basis points and if it's normally distributed, then our worst expected shock to the yield, let's presume a long position. So our worst expected shock or stress to the yield would be a 50 basis point increase. Then our primitives are zero coupon bonds. So the Macaulay duration of a zero coupon bond is equal to its maturity. The modified duration is just one, is the, is the Mac, Macaulay duration divided by one plus the yield. We're assuming annual compounding. So even if you don't know how we get the modified duration, you can see here that it's a little bit less than the Macaulay duration. So we end up here because our primitives are conveniently zero coupon bonds. After all, that's the point, convenient risk primitives. Our, we end up with modified durations that are slightly less than the term structure of our risk factor here at five years, 4.7 years for a modified duration. Then you can see the returns VAR is simply the yield VAR multiplied by the duration, which is, right, a classic uh, change in yield multiplied by the duration gives us an estimate of the change in price, and I'm going to use percentages. So, again, to summarize here, if we take the last bottom row, if we get the worst expected yield shock of about 50 basis points, where it's expected with 95% confidence, here at the five-year vertex, for a zero coupon bond that has a modified duration of almost five years, we would expect the zero coupons price to drop, this is risk after all, by about almost 2.5%. So that's the vector here of risk or returns VAR that really is the vector of primitive risk factors. Then we're going to take our portfolio and map it to them. So in this worksheet here, a little more dense, but a lot of information we don't need for purposes of the VAR mapping. And this just summarizes the portfolio, right? We have a two bond portfolio, five years and one year. Their coupons equal their uh, yields. In the case of the five-year bond, 6% coupon, 6% yield, so that the price is equal to the face value, right? If the yield equals the coupon, then the bond price is to par. So that's part of the set of assumptions. If I didn't mention that, what I did with my spreadsheet here is I replicated Jorian's example and I matched it exactly if I've even added some numbers. So I'm highly confident that it's based on his calculations and I've had, I include even more information. So that's our portfolio. 
Here we've got the cash flows. Of course, this is the five-year bond with $6 annual coupons. Here's the uh, term structure of spot rates, such that we use those to discount the future values to present values here. And the sum of the present values is the theoretical bond price. You can see here, by design of the scenario, we end up with price equal to par, consistent with coupon equal to yield, but also shows us, reminds us that the spot rate's different than the yield. And by, by design here, although the in the case of bond one, for example, the yield is 6%, matches the coupon, the bond will price to par, it does not necessarily imply a flat spot rate at 6%. So I think that's interesting. Then I've got duration calculations down here. I'll let you work that out if you're interested because the only one I'm going to use at the moment is the portfolio's Macaulay duration, 2.733 years, which duration is conveniently a weighted average of values in the portfolio. We have here an equally weighted conveniently an equally weighted portfolio. So the portfolio's duration of 2.733 years is an average of each component duration, conveniently. So just keep in mind, our portfolio's Macaulay duration is 2.733 years because that's gonna be one of our approaches, one of the three. And then here, I'll summarize the results that we're gonna see in the next page which illustrates specifically the three approaches. But you can see here, we're gonna have prints, and this is in order uh, least sophisticated to most sophisticated. We have principal matching, mapping, and you can see it's just shy of 3 million, again, for a 95% value at risk. That's what we're doing here. We're computing the 95% value at risk for the $200 million portfolio. Meaning, what we mean here is, only 5% of the time do we expect the loss to be worse than 2.96 million dollars. Okay, but that's the simplest approach. Then we will look at duration mapping. You can see the value is a little bit less, but but pretty close. And then most sophisticated would be cash flow mapping, which is even lower. And that parses into either a naive undiversified approach or a sophisticated diversified approach. I'll show you what that means, but you can see here our least sophisticated, but has the virtue being very simple, is principal mapping. And our most sophisticated is cash flow mapping diversified. And here it is. And really, the first two are going to be very simple. Here we have the bond portfolio, future cash flows. Here's that term structure of spot rates. And here I've replicated Jorian's table 11.2. And this column is the present value of the cash flows. So you notice here we have... For mapping purposes, we have present values, and there are three columns. Present, it's 200 million if we're going to use principal mapping. That's the entire portfolio. It's 200 million if we duration mapping. That's the entire portfolio. If we use cash flow mapping, it's also here the sum 200 million. And I'm going to just color that yellow to be consistent. Not a very good yellow, but I'll do that one because that's the three approaches. But here, present values, and we're going to map the entire 200 million of the portfolio. Okay, this column here, now I'm showing you, this is my own, it's not in Jorian. Now I'm show, Now I here I've got repeated that vector of risk factors, right? This is core to our process. We, I, we selected in this case, the possible set of five, risk factors where such that we would map to zero coupon bonds can would we here we would this is would this here describes mapping to a one year zero coupon bond here's a three year zero coupon bond here's a five year zero coupon bond so in principle mapping we take a single risk factor and we map to the port uh, portfolio's average maturity. We have a five-year bond and a one-year bond. So the portfolio's average maturity is three years. And so we're going to take the entire 200 million and map to that single risk factor, which, is, which you can see here is the a three-year zero coupon bond. So my risk here, I'm just, I just, I'm that's, there's no math there. I'm just using that 1.5, uh, 
the, the almost 1.5%. And the VAR here, it just multiplies. In other words, in other words, we've taken this portfolio of two bonds and replaced it. That's the mapping for this purpose. We've replaced it with a single zero coupon bond with three-year maturity because the portfolio has an average maturity three years of $200, of $200 million, such that if we replaced that, then we could ask a much simpler question of the VAR. What if they had the worst expected yield shock, right? Then because of the that zero coupon bonds duration, this would be the price drop, which would translate, you can see here, into almost a $3 million drop in that zero coupon, three-year zero coupon bond that we've replaced, that has replaced our portfolio. So that's all principal mapping is. Replace the portfolio with a single risk factor that in this case is a three-year zero coupon bond. Duration mapping, very similar. We also only maps to a single risk factor, but in this case, it's going to be the portfolio's duration, which recall we saw on the previous page, that was 2.733 years. 2.733 years is between two and three years. So the way that I look at this is this is mapping to in between the two-year primitive and the three-year primitive. And so, but still you can see it's the entire 200 million mapped to that point that's between the two and three. So you could think of that as being allocated between the two based on an interpolation. And so that's just a straight interpolation and we're getting $2.7 million loss on the portfolio under the duration mapping. The argument is that both of these are relatively simple to execute, but maybe, but not as sophisticated. Duration mapping would be better than principal mapping. Both of these, however, map, you can see, to a single risk factor, or if you prefer, as I do, to think of duration mapping as uh, allocating between two risk factors depending on the specific duration, because 2.733 years is not a risk factor in our, in our vector of primitives here. Okay, then cash flow mapping is the most sophisticated, and what it does is it map it groups the cash flows and maps them to each of our primitives. Of course, we selected our primitives because that's when the cash flows occur. So this is a straightforward process here of taking the present value of the cash flows. That's this column here, and of course they must sum to 200 million, and we're mapping the present value cash flow as a group onto that primitive risk factor here, same vector, such that the individual value at risk, what we call the individual value risk, is simply the product. Then the sum of those right here in blue, this is the undiversified value at risk under cash flow mapping because we've summed them up. What does undiversified mean here in this context? Well, it means that you can see here implicitly it means this risk, again, is based on an assumption of a worst expected adverse shock in the yield that's been multiplied by the duration for the zero coupon bond that characterizes this risk factor. So by adding all of these, we're assuming that simultaneously these yield shocks would occur all together at their worst level. We add them up. That's undiversified because we're not simulating the more realistic scenario that probably the these the vertices the vertices on this term structure are not perfectly correlated, which is say maybe year three will the yield will shock worst case, but year four maybe not so much. M so diversification refers to correlation along this term structure and is captured here in the correlation matrix where I am using Jorian's value. And you'll notice that the values are pretty close to one. So we have imperfect correlation, but it's more like almost perfect correlation. And so that allows us with a really pretty straightforward matrix multiplication, which I'm not going to perform here, to compute here the diversified value at risk for the portfolio and our cash flow mapping, which if these were all ones, this by definition would need to equal the same 2.63 million, but there we have some imperfect correlation here 
among the cash flow vertices and the term structure. So we're going to get a value a little bit less. But that is the diversified value at risk under the cash flow mapping. We've taken the entire $200 million bond portfolio. And really, as opposed to these two approaches where we took that whole value and replaced it with a single three-year zero coupon bond or blended it between a two and a three-year zero coupon bond. Here, we've taken and allocated the $2 million into five of what Jorian calls cash flow vertices. And then we let the, we assume the worst expected shock to all five of these primitive risk factors to get our, in this case, diversified portfolio VAR. So those are the three approaches. Remember, this was really just for a fixed income bond. So subsequently in his chapter, he goes in, it goes into a brief discussion about how we would mix other instruments like options or currency uh, forward contracts onto, onto their own risk factors, right? These risk factors, of course, they're very uh, bond specific because that's the asset class we're looking at, but different asset classes will have their own primitive risk factors. So if this video was helpful, please subscribe to the channel and you'll get updated on my next video. Thank you.